are living in quite stressful times. You're being bombarded every day with new distressing information about what happened in the last 24 hours. You're being made aware of problems that you didn't even know you had. But of course, you're being sold a solution to that. And on top of everything, although we have the means to connect with each other now more than ever before, we're actually feeling very lonely. Because of all of this, it is only natural that people would develop some kind of coping strategies and one of the let's say harmless ones at least the first few times when you do it is food because of this there has been a large increase in the people online who share their stories and try to help other people out that are struggling with emotional eating or even binge eating and some advice is definitely more helpful than other but i think it would also be helpful to know how this issue is being tackled clinically this is why today we're going to be talking about research that is linked to the treatment of emotional eating and also binge eating they're not the same by the way i'm going to get into that and i strongly encourage you if you recognize yourself in what we're about to discuss today to at least consider getting some professional help big disclaimer first of all the obvious one we're going to be talking disordered eating today and second this is not medical advice i'm not a medical professional i'm simply going to be reviewing scientific literature on the treatment to these conditions anyways let's get right into the video first of all what exactly do we define as emotional eating emotional eating is technically not a disorder it is more of a disordered eating pattern where one tends to over consume foods as a response to certain negative emotions that might be stress that might be sadness it is different for everyone and while people who are not emotional eaters tend to decrease their food consumption under times of stress or negative experiences in general people who are emotional eaters tend to do the opposites more often than not they also reach for the so-called hyper palatable foods so foods that are high in sugar and fats and there are multiple theories as to why this happens one of those is that this activates reward pathways in the brain which you know is why the entire theory of food addiction came to be i discussed this a lot more in depth in my stress and weight loss video you might go and check that out but other theories include generally our bodies and our psyche's predisposition to the consumption of those types of foods infants according to this one paper are indeed more likely to go for sweet things and also salty things compared to sour and bitter things just because sour and bitter as a taste might indicate that there's some toxin in that type of food there was this other study on 18 year old babies some of them had a rapid weight gain and some of them did not experience that and the ones with the more rapid weight gain were actually actively choosing their favorite foods as a pleasure source compared to toys or whatever the other children were given on top of that the sweet taste itself could be activating a similar pathway in the brain linked to having a romantic partner it's it's a lot of things that could be leading to this situation but the issue itself is not as little as you might think it is there was this survey by the american psychology association which found that over 30 percent of people that were interviewed did engage in emotional eating in the past months around 40 percent of them even i think around half of them did experience that weekly generally emotional eating being overweight and being a woman seems to be a very positive connection like those three things seem to come together more often than being an emotional eater and being a man and one study proposed that this might be due to women's impulsivity and it was also related to low orientation in life which is a very weird thing to say in a paper my personal theory is that men just have other types of coping mechanisms that are not food emotional eating is also more often observed in people that already suffer from an 
another type of mental disorder or at least experience those symptoms of other mental disorders more often. This applies to people who have already been diagnosed with depression or experienced some depressive episodes. There was even one study that talked about the depression genotype and how this was also strongly expressed in people that engaged in emotional eating. However, this correlation was only found in this subgroup of white people and the same was not investigated for people of color, which is where the limitation of the study is because this genotype is not equally expressed in all ethnicities. There was also one study on students that were completing degrees, I think, in healthcare. This paper found that the students there who experienced higher grades of anxiety also engaged in emotional eating. Different types of unhealthy behaviors tend to come together in package most of the time. Now let's get into the treatment options for people that engage in emotional eating. Since it is not a clinical disorder, there is also not a very specific protocol as to how you can tackle the issue and this is probably why the paper that I found about this is actually from last year. There were different strategies that were investigated. The ones that found the largest amounts of success were behavioral change techniques that involved the connection to future version of yourself. This sounds very cringe already because it might remind you of any self-help video that you've watched which says you to connect to the highest version of yourself. Ask yourself what would she do and like live as that version now but it is what tends to help people actually. You know for these people being the highest version of themselves is just not engaging in those behaviors. It is not in the I envision myself being on a holiday in Santorini type of thing. Although it might seem quite cringe and delusional, it has actually found to be very helpful for those people. So we should not discard completely those types of strategies. There are also these self-regulation practices and this involves, I suppose, the delivery to these people of a protocol that they have to follow and then it is up to them to exercise self-control on their own behaviors, which again, in my opinion, could lead to them developing more self-confidence because they're self-regulating the entire time. They improve their problem-solving skills because they do not have somebody looking over their shoulder at all times. Psychological flexibility is also a big one here. This is basically the concept that having too strict and too rigid diet rules does not help you in the long run because it is higher to stick to those and might actually exacerbate binge eating. This is why flexibility is encouraged. Complete abstain from, let's say, hyper palatable, highly attractive foods is not something that is recommended. And the last one that they discussed here was the importance of social support and having a system of people, your family, your friends, your loved ones, your partner, that would support you along the journey and this is especially crucial for people that do not have enough self-confidence or self-compassion. This is important for people who tend to think very critically of themselves and might relapse after one bad day on their journey. Having people support you at all times and encourage you that you can do it and that you can succeed sounds, you know, very simple to recommend, but I think that for people who suffer from these types of eating behaviors, they tend to isolate a lot because of guilt, shame and other negative emotions and having a social support system is not something so self-explanatory for them. These were all of the treatments that were discussed for emotional eaters. It is not a large body of research since this is technically not a diagnosis but the fact that I still found one review was a positive step in the right direction. Now moving on to the binge eating disorder. This is actually a clinical disorder. Again, you could be having episodes of binge eating, but it is not the same as having this diagnosis. To be diagnosed with binge eating would mean to experience binge eating episodes at least once per week for at least three months. And its severity depends on the number of episodes that you experience per week. What differentiates it from other diagnoses and other eating disorders is the fact that there is not really a compensatory behavior to that. I mean, no overexercising, no fasting, but that does not mean that you do not feel guilt or shame or embarrassment because of what you did. It just means that you do not engage in, you know, the compensatory techniques that would then classify you in 
on another diagnosis. And the factors that could predispose you to this are actually a lot, starting with biological factors, including specific genotypes, going over to psychological factors, which even include character traits such as perfectionism, societal factors, your childhood. The list is very long. On top of that, if you have a pre-existing other condition, such as depression or anxiety or some type of mood disorder, that might increase the likelihood of you engaging in those types of unhealthy eating behaviors. Since this is a diagnosis, it was also easier to find a research paper that talks about the different types of treatments more in depth. Here, the biggest one that had the largest amount of evidence behind it was cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy is not the same as conventional therapy. It is different in the way that it does not place a large amount of focus on the past and what brought you here, it is more focused on the present and how you can right now unlearn those unhealthy patterns and learn to solve the issue that you have at hand so that you can make better choices in the future. It is more future oriented. Patients would also receive, let's say, homework that they would have to complete. They would have, of course, regular sessions with a specific therapist. These types of therapies were found to have the largest positive impact and they are very widely implemented. Also, I want to mention that they were actually more effective than prescribing medication for binge eating because that can be done too, but it is kind of a last resort if the therapy is really don't work at all. My point here is that pharmacological treatments can at some times actually be less effective than just going to therapy, especially when talking about mental health conditions. So opting out for a therapy session here would be definitely more beneficial. There is also the other method, which is again cognitive behavioral therapy, but it is guided self-help subgroup, which means that people would receive some type of protocol, some type of self help, you know, guide that would give them orientation as how to proceed and they would also have brief sessions with the therapist. These types of interventions were found to be very successful for people that need more flexibility and would not like to have meetings with therapists that often or, this is my own opinion, for people that would not like to see other people that often in terms of therapists or even if there are group sessions because of shame or something else, this is a type of treatment that might be more helpful for those people. And these were also found to be more successful, of course, than receiving no therapy at all. Moving on to interpersonal psychotherapy, this is the other type of treatment that has proven to be comparably successful to the cognitive behavioral therapy and it is more similar to the conventional therapy in the sense that it is based on the theory that there is something that you're suppressing when you're engaging in this type of eating behaviors. So the idea here is to address the issue at hand that you are trying to combat when compensating with eating. These types of therapies were found to be very successful for people that have an accompanying mental condition. So for them, I suppose you're treating both things when you're choosing that type of treatment. There are also other treatments investigated, such as the behavioral weight loss treatment, which in its sense is just giving you an exercise regime and a meal plan, and here you're kind of treating the effects of beach eating, the consequence, and it is no surprise that it was found to be unsuccessful really, because then you're not really tackling the root of the issue or the behavior itself, you're just treating the aftermath of the problem. There are also some other types of interventions such as the dialectical behavior therapy which encourage mindfulness and also emotional regulation and the point here is kind of your nervous system to be regulated this is this is just a very popular concept right now but I, I had to use it so after regulating your nervous system then the theory here is that you will not be engaging in, in these behaviors but this is a growing body of research that does not have enough scientific backing to say this is what you would go for instead of cognitive behavior therapy or the interpersonal psychotherapy. So other alternative treatments include appetite 
include appetite, awareness, which sounds kind of shady because if you have a lot of food noise, I don't see how that would work. For some of us, the food noise is so loud that I know I'm not hungry, but that does not help me. And I could still, if I am really in that state of mind, go and overeat. Other types of therapies involve even virtual reality. There's a lot of things that are being implemented right now to try and fight the issue at hand since it's growing, unfortunately. There are some things to mention that could be having an impact on the outcome of these interventions. The first predictor is the rapid response to the therapy. So research has shown that if you respond positively somewhere around until the fourth session, then you are more statistically likely to succeed than somebody that did not respond up until the fourth session. These are just statistics. That does not mean that you're not going to succeed at all. But it means that if you managed to experience a decrease in the episodes up until the fourth session then you're probably going to make it sooner the other negative predictor so something that could set you back is some other type of mental condition prior to the treatment apart from the pinch eating disorder this is something that i already discussed these people need a different type of therapy that would help them move forward that also addresses the other type of mental issues weight and shape concerns is kind of you know something that i think most people have when they have a binge eating disorder this is concerning the outcome how much weight would you lose and generally how is your body image and if that is very negative that might also impact your journey towards recovery and lastly dietary restraint nothing new under the sun if you're being very restrictive very rigid if you do not allow yourself room for freedom then you're going to find it harder to succeed in the long run i think this is the part of the video where i say something Something that sounds very obvious but it's important one bad day on your journey does not define your entire journey and one good day on the journey also does not define your entire journey and to give you a very obvious example when these studies are performed the follow-up is usually months after the treatment started these people that participate and that had a positive outcome they were not being monitored every single day as to did they overeat on that day or not we're looking at the end outcome each time having more self-compassion and not letting one bad day define how you're going to proceed the next day is really the most important thing when talking about disordered eating behaviors because every day you can really start over you also do not have to do this alone although you see a lot of people online that manage to help themselves and that have not went to therapy if you feel the need to go out and seek professional help you should definitely make your use of that and of course if you have the financial ability to do that because these types of issues are something that should not be ignored and can over time lead to a decline both your physical and your mental health thank you so much for being here with me today i hope that you found the video helpful let me know down in the comments below if you would like me to do a video on a specific topic next time also don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the contents of today's video thank you again for watching and I will see you in the next one.